viruses are not considered alive. There's actually a fair argument among, um, among those in the field that they should be considered life forms, um, but at this point they do not match our, our definition of life. However, they have had a great effect on living things, and like many living things, viruses can evolve. So they've got genetic material that changes over time, and, uh, and they can evolve quite a bit. So our influenza viruses, starting with the 1919, at least for, for this presentation, there were actually two epidemics previous um, or prior to the 1918-1919 uh, epidemic. Uh, the, their um, mortality was nowhere near what we recorded in, um, in this epidemic. So for the global numbers, um, we're looking at about an estimated 500 million people were infected, and depending on the reference you use, the number of people that died from this, uh, from this epidemic of influenza, somewhere between 20 and 100 million people. It's a little bit difficult to, to really nail that down. Um, this is a number of people that died in a, in a period of nine months. So this was um, fast. There's a variety of reasons why people have kind of pointed to this as being such a bad epidemic. Um, everything from no antibiotics to treat secondary infections. So one of the problems with influenza is we do get secondary infections, so bacterial infections on top of that viral infection. Um, World War I was going on. Did somebody die because of the war? Did the influenza just make it worse? Would they have died anyway? Hard to tell. Um, because of the war, was there limited access to health care? Um, was it just because this seemed to be an entirely new virus? Was it because people were traveling around a little bit um, more broadly than they used to? Or was it because there were no vaccines then? We didn't get our first vaccine for influenza until about 1945. Um, that's when it was provided to the military for what? Why did we want to make sure that our soldiers didn't get the flu in 1945? Yeah, so they were hoping to roll it out before then, but, um, but that's the time that it was actually rolled out and the first civilian population got vaccinated in uh, 1946. So, well, there weren't any vaccines at that time. Many of these other things were certainly applicable to the prior years. But when we look at what happened in the years prior, what we see with a typical influenza of epidemic is that this is uh, down here on our x-axis, we've got age and deaths. So typically, what we'll see even today with an uh, influenza epidemic is that primarily the people who are dying are those that are very young and those that are elderly. Usually the people in the middle, which is this dotted line here, basically most everybody here, in this range is doing pretty well. One of the things that really, really stuck out about this particular epidemic was that rather than having a U-shape, ah, there we go, a U-shape, it has this W-shape. So this is something that was very unusual about that epidemic of influenza. Um, pandemics, with influenza, um, that one was odd, but our most recent one was a little odd too. When we look at the death associated with the most recent pandemic, which was in 2009, we see, again, the young not doing so well, but guess what? 
if you're older for, the, for this one, you actually did a lot better than you did in 1918. So this is also odd, an odd trend for, for influenza. Um, this is just the death numbers. Say, so, well, we've got better health care now. These are the infection numbers. So simply the um, number of people per 100,000 that were infected by that 2009 flu. Um, again, younger had a higher rate of infection than actually folks in this older range. So kind of an interesting trend, so, some oddness associated with influenza infection. Um, in 1918, again, the big problem was um, a little bit of trivia here for our soldiers. They did particularly poorly. About one in 67 US soldiers died from influenza. Um, but again, the thing that you want to kind of keep in the back of your mind is in the 1918 influenza, the mortality in this 14 to 40 year range, um, and this, uh, this number is um, per 100,000, so 100, 100 cases per 100,000 uh, population. That's what the specific death rate is. So a problem here, a conundrum. Why was that the case? Fast forward a little bit to where we are now. So we had this really nasty strain of, of influenza in 1918. Now we talk primarily about seasonal influenza um, in the United States. So all the stats on this one will be United States. Every year, somewhere between 5 and 20% of the population is infected. Hospitalization rates are pretty high. Over 200,000 people are, are usually hospitalized every year. And death is somewhere between 12 and 56,000 people. It's rather expensive. 34.1 million outpatient visits, 3.1 million hospital days. Anybody who's spending a little time in the hospital knows how expensive that is. So a lot of money there. 17 million work days lost with a average annual burden of somewhere around $87.1 billion in this country alone. So that's just the United States. Um, so a costly disease. And this year, you may have heard that this is a, a year that, um, that's a little bit worse than some of the more recent years, and, and it is. So at week five, this is the um, number of laboratory-confirmed influenza hospitalizations, um, the rate per 100,000. If you look where we are at, um, at week five compared to previous seasons, um, we have a lot more people hospitalized than we have in, um, in previous years. So it is a, a, a rough season. If we want to compare what things looked like last year, what we've got here is a progression through flu season. So starting in October of 16, running through uh, October of 17, and you can see the dates up top. As we run through flu season, we can see more influenza showing up, and then things get better. So red being bad, green being good. And I will stop this one there and show you what this year's looks like. Starting in October, Everything's nice. As we go into November, start seeing some more flu showing up. End of December through January. And this is where we are. Flu season is bad. <laughs> so yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a rough season. 
fortunately for those in that um, say 14 to, to 40 year range, the U demographic, that, or uh, the U graphic that I showed earlier, is holding for this year. It's just that more people are, are getting sick. So the, the people dying are still at either end of the spectrum. There isn't a lot of death in the middle, which is, which is good news. So when we talk about influenza virus, there are several species of influenza virus. We have these A through D. Um, influenza virus D was just published on in, in 2016. So this is a newly recognized influenza virus. Um, it is not one that infects people. It's uh, cattle and goats. Eventually it might get to us, but so far it has not. When we talk about influenza A, we will, in influenza A, I put that one in red because it causes um, the most illness and the most serious illness. Um, influenza B is also pretty common and common among people. C, not so much. The strains get designated. We talk about influenza H1N1 or H7N9. And what that refers to is when we look at the virus structure, there are two proteins that stick out from the surface of that virus. Hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. Hemagglutinin is a protein, you can just call it H. This is what attaches to a receptor on a host cell. Once that receptor is bound, the virus is internalized, goes through its replication cycle, and when it comes time for the virus to be released from that host cell, neuraminidase, this other protein on the surface, is the one that's responsible for that. We have, in the influenza viruses, uh, about 16 different types of, of H and nine different types of N. So there's lots of different combinations we can see being uh, expressed on the surface of an influenza virus. At the moment, what we have circulating around in, um, in this country is about 73.3% is influenza virus A. That's what IVA refers to. 26.7% um, is the B. Of the A's, that 2009 pandemic strain makes up about 13.5%, and the most common circulating one right now is uh, H3N2 at 78.3%. Um, the rest have not been uh, typed. They're just untyped A's. So we, we haven't assigned those yet. How do those proportions match the proportions in the vaccine for the year? Um, the, typically what we do with the vaccine is it's equal proportions of either three or four viruses. Um, the most common flu shot has three, um, two A's and a B. So what we have this year is an H1N1, the pandemic H1N1 strain. We've got an H3N2, um, but there may have been some changes in H3N2, or um, there's another thing that I'm going to talk about in a little bit that, that might also be responsible for some of our problem with H3N2 right now. When we look at the virus, when we look at the structure of the virus, we've got those proteins sticking out from the surface. This blue layer here is membrane that it took from its previous host. That membrane is attached to this stuff in the middle by something called a matrix, and that's shown in orange. And then inside, we've got these squiggly lines. Those squiggly lines are ribonucleic acid, or RNA. So its genome is RNA. Attached to that RNA, is this little purple ball here. And each strand of RNA, and there are eight segments of RNA in this virus, bound to that is that little purple ball that is the RNA copier. It's an enzyme called RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. It is responsible for making copies of RNA. Um, we typically, when we're making RNA, our cells make RNA from DNA. We don't have an enzyme that, is, that can actually copy this genome. So the virus actually has to code for that one enzyme 
and, and that's what's stuck at the end there. Um, all of these things, the hemagglutinin, the neuraminidase, these matrix proteins, the um, nucleoprotein that's attached to the squiggly line here, and that polymerase are all coded for on each of these segments. The first three segments code for the polymerase. Next segment, that hemagglutinin protein, then the nucleoprotein, these little purple dots that are bound to the RNA, matrix proteins, and then uh, these non-structural proteins that are involved in exporting of RNA from the nucleus. We'll talk about that one in just a minute. The host range for influenza is quite wide. The top two images here are, as you probably recognize, a little bit of biology, these are waterfowl, so things like ducks, geese, and swans. They are the ones that are pretty much responsible for perpetuating all of the different influenza strains that are out there. So this is our natural reservoir for these. All the strains that are existing can infect those, those critters. So a lot of times when new strains pop up, we point at them because that's where these strains have originated. The influenza virus, though, has expanded its range from, from those critters to a variety of others. So we're clearly aware that humans are capable of being infected. Horses have their own set of influenza strains. Got a dog here. The influenza virus that infects dogs actually originated in horses. We got a mutant and that ended up in dogs. Chickens here can infect a variety of things. Um, the strains that infect cats or that have, been, have infected cats arose in chickens. Chickens, some of the viruses that we've pulled from them, we have experimentally been able to infect um, rabbits and skunks with and shown that those organisms can replicate enough virus to pass it back to things like chickens. Um, other, other organisms, we've got whales and porpoises and seals that are infected by influenza. They have their own strains. Pigs can be infected by a lot of strains of influenza, and we'll talk about why that's important in just a little bit. Um, and then this guy here, our ferret. Ferrets are actually the model organism that we use for studying influenza virus. The way that they respond to influenza virus is very similar to the way that we do. So, um, so a lot of the studies that are done with, uh, the, that have been done with influenza viruses have been done with ferrets. Okay, three, two, one, there we go. Okay, so what goes on when we get exposed to an influenza virus is we breathe in droplets that have been expelled by someone else. So sneezing, me wandering around talking to you, Things like this can spread the influenza virus all around. So here we've got the image of our influenza virus. We've got the RNA packaged, those little purple proteins surrounding it. And then external to that, we've got a lipid membrane from the uh, host organism. And then these neuraminidase and hemagglutinin proteins sticking out from the surface. So once these get expelled, got these aerosol droplets that will travel to the poor, unfortunate people around you. Those viruses, for a seasonal flu virus, will then infect the epithelial cells in your upper respiratory tract. It does this by using that hemagglutinin protein 
and attaching to a sialic acid residue on the surface of a host cell. That triggers the host cell to bring it in. That virus is then transported to an area near the nucleus where it will uncoat. So here it's being transported. And now it's starting to uncoat. And it will release its RNA and that copying enzyme into the nucleus. Once that's in the nucleus of the host cell, so here it's going into the nucleus. Once it's in the nucleus, we get copying of that RNA genome. And we also get expression of the RNA. So proteins are produced from that RNA. They're exported. Those RNAs are exported. The proteins are produced, imported back in, where they coat those genomes, and then expelled again from the nucleus. Other proteins are produced and then inserted on the surface of the host cell, that neuraminidase and the hemagglutinin. The viral genome associates with that, and then the viruses leave the host cell. If you're lucky, you've developed an immune response, and you've got antibodies which can bind to those viruses and target them for destruction by white blood cells. <laughs> so following that replication or following the initial exposure to that virus, what you'll get is those viruses entering your cells and replicating. Fortunately, we have an immune system that is pretty good at recognizing things that aren't supposed to be there. Our immune response is divided into two sort of broad categories, what we call our innate immune response that will um, take care of things that you haven't seen before, that your body hasn't seen before. And then we've got something called acquired immunity. So what happens following infection is this innate immune response. In this response, the cells that are infected realize that something is wrong and send out some chemical signals to white blood cells. It attracts them there, then those white blood cells come in and start destroying those infected cells. And just to be on the safe side, they'll destroy all those cells around there, around the infected cells as well, just in case that virus got out. Then they'll start to clean up that damage, and parts of that damage will be say, parts of the influenza virus. It will then show parts of that influenza virus to additional cells in the immune system, which will then train, essentially, other white blood cells to recognize infected cells and kill them, or to make antibodies that will bind to the influenza virus. The timeline for this, got it roughly down here on the bottom, in the first few days following infection, you know, I feel a little tired, but not too bad. As this innate immune response really kicks in, and you start getting death and destruction in those um, cells in the upper respiratory tract, you'll get a sore throat. You'll start coughing. A fever will occur. So your body's hoping by increasing that body temperature, you can make it so that that influenza virus doesn't replicate as well. So when you're really feeling like crap with the flu, it's usually about four-ish days um, into that viral replication, into that innate immunity, and then you switch over to this acquired immunity. So cells and things are being trained to recognize that influenza virus, and the other nice thing that happens in this step is your immune system, your innate immune system, starts to settle down a bit. So that is suppressed a bit as this ramps up. So in a typical infection, typical seasonal flu, 
by the time um, you're a week, week and a half in, you're feeling better, you're tired, but you're feeling better. And that's because this portion of your immunity has kicked in. So what's happened again is essentially your immune system has been trained to specifically recognize infected cells so that the healthy cells are no longer being targeted. Antibodies, so the other arm of, of acquired immunity, antibodies that are produced, these are just proteins, they'll bind to the surface of a virus, covering up that hemagglutinin that that virus is using to attach to a host cell. So we call that virus neutralization. It's essentially stopped from entering a next uh, host cell because it's got that antibody attached to it. Um, the other nice thing that antibodies do is they'll target that virus for uh, destruction, like we saw in the video, that big white blood cell. Recognized it, grabbed it, destroyed it. So for the influenza virus, when we develop an immune response, it can either be through infection and having a successful immune response, getting over it, then that particular strain you can develop immunity to, or we have the option for vaccination. And there's a variety of different types of vaccines out there. Your typical flu shot will contain either three or four viruses, they get inactivated, so we chemically inactivate them. Those get injected, and your immune system recognizes those things as foreign and develops a response. We also have a nasal spray option that has altered viruses, um, things that are called cold adapted viruses that basically give you a very brief infection, but they don't replicate well at body temperature. So you can then develop an immune response that way. Um, those will also have three or four strains. Um, there's also a relatively new technology. Of, we have a flu patch, got a patch for everything now. We do have a flu patch. It's got these little needly things in it. It's basically applied to your skin um, just within the um, epidermal layer, and it's brought in that way. The hope is that it's much. Um, pretty much non-painless, um, so it's, it's, it's not painless, and will stay on your arm for a couple days, then you simply peel it off. Um, so there are a variety of, of options for, for flu vaccines. One of the tricky things about flu vaccines is for, most, for the most part, we cultivate the viruses that we use to make the vaccines in eggs. So if you have an egg allergy, that, that will preclude you from getting most of the vaccines. There are other options out there um, that you need to request if you have an egg allergy. So you can actually get those vaccines, it's just they're not, um, not readily available. Now the way that we figure out what strains to put into the vaccine is basically we look and see what, oops. We look to see what strains were circulating at the end of the last flu season, because those are the ones most likely to be there when the next flu season starts. Flu season runs from October till pretty much the end of March. So at the end of March, we evaluate what, um, what the uh, most dominant flu strains were at the end of that month, and that's what gets incorporated into the next set of vaccines. So here, it is, there is a little bit of guesswork here, it's not perfect, but it's about, um, it's the best we can do right now. And I'll be talking more about some of the other things we can do in just a little bit. <coughs> now, one of the tricky things about the influenza virus is that there are so many strains out there. We don't just have the combination of different H's and N's. That's the big part. The smaller part is as these viruses replicate, the viral enzyme that copies the RNA makes a lot of mistakes. So essentially every 10,000 bases there's a mistake. The genome 
of influenza is not all that large. So we've got those eight segments, and the sum of those eight, eight segments equals about 13,000 bases of RNA. So essentially, each time we get a genome copied, there's a mistake. This last term, burst size, refers to the amount of viruses released by a cell. So for influenza, the, uh, the number of viruses that will be released ranges from 1,000 to 10,000 viruses. So every single one of those might have a mistake. Certainly some of those mistakes uh, might make it so that the virus can't replicate. Usually what we'll see is a pretty subtle change, but if it's in those surface proteins, which is what your immune system is sort of geared to recognize, if it's in those, you have a subtle change, the antibody that you made to bind to that might not bind as well. In bad cases, it won't bind at all. So these new strains that are developed by this process, it's referred to as genetic drift or antigenic drift. These are small mutations that make some subtle changes in the structure of these viruses. The thing that we worry more about is a process called reassortment. This process refers to what happens when we have a co-infection with more than one type of the influenza virus. So receptors for the virus, we have receptors that bind seasonal influenza virus in our upper respiratory tract. Um, pigs have them in their upper respiratory tract. They also have them in their digestive tract. Birds primarily have receptors for influenza virus, for their seasonal influenza viruses um, are primarily in their digestive tract. So we've got critters that can be infected by influenza virus in different areas of the body. And then we have things like pigs that can be infected in both the respiratory tract and the digestive tract. And the receptors are very similar to both us and birds. So they make a very good mixing vessel for influenza viruses. And when you have a co-infection, if you have, say, an H1N1 virus and an H3N2 virus, when the viruses get assembled, there can be some mix mixing and matching of each of those segments. So in a co-infection, what goes in, your H1N1 and your H3N2, can reassort. And what comes out of that cell might be those two and a new strain, something like an H3N1. When this happens, now we've got a virus produced that if it gets out in the population, it's one that we haven't seen before. They say, well, we might have seen both the H3 and the N1, which is possible, but the way they get arranged on the surface may mean that different parts of those proteins are exposed. So your immune system sees something that's a bit different and the antibodies you made don't bind as well to this new virus. What we've seen throughout history are just a few major pandemics from reassortment events. Going back to 1889, we've got uh, a Russian uh, influenza, which is an H H2N2 strain, which circulated for a while after that first pandemic. Then we had a reassortment event, which resulted in H3N8. That's our old Hong Kong influenza. The next big pandemic, so this H1N1, that was our 1918. <coughs> Had a couple more pandemics. 1957, we went back to an H2N2. 1968, our Hong Kong uh, H3N2. 
Then another H1N1 popped up, that's still circulating. And then we had our pandemic H1N1 strain. The reassortment events that took place for the 1918 pandemic looks like we had a reassortment event between a human and an avian strain. And that's what ended up in this H1N1 from 1918. That virus circulated around for a while, then reassorted with another avian virus to give us that H2N2. That virus hung around for a while till we had 68 reassortment event, which gave us our H3N2. That one has now been circulating around for a while, as well as seasonal H1N1s. Now what happened in 2009 was kind of an interesting event. Luckily we have lots of tools to track these things now. What we had in North America was a reassortment between three viruses that ended up in, in pigs. A classical swine flu, North American bird flu, and a human H3N2. Those all reassorted in pigs, it passed between pigs, and then we had the addition of this Eurasian, uh, Eurasian avian-like swine flu that contributed a couple of segments, and that is what ended up in the pandemic flu that was passed easily from person to person. So we picked that up from, from swine. Now as you'll see, the segments here look very, very different. Even if you can't read them, it's okay, they're color-coded. The only one that came from our human H3N2 is just a little portion of the, um, of the polymerase enzyme. So one of the genes that goes into making that polymerase enzyme. Very virus in the human population. This one was also odd because it did not conform to our flu season. Where you mentioned flu season runs October to March. The viruses have learned that, they know that. So that's when they start. Kidding. <laughs> what was screwy about the swine flu, which is our H1N1 pandemic flu, what was screwy about that one is that that actually emerged in April. So the month after our typical flu season stops. So it started in April and then ran pretty much the entire gamut of flu season. And now this one is circulating in a typical flu season. So it's adapted, it's adapted to our typical flu season, which we appreciate. <coughs> what this doesn't answer, so now we know where these flu strains are coming from. What that doesn't answer though is why that flu was so bad. We've got a little bit of insight into this now. Um, the nasty flu strains, so the ones we worry about, the 1918 flu, when we talk about the nasty bird flus. These are what we call highly pathogenic influenza strains. And what happens when these, with these guys is they have a higher affinity for receptors in your lower respiratory tract. So they bind preferentially there, and once they replicate there, they screw up the cell-cell communication that allows us to shift from innate to adaptive immunity. So what happens is once those cells get infected, rather than going from this inflammatory response to an adaptive response, the innate response gets stuck in a feedback loop. So we get inflammation and then signals are sent for more inflammation. And we don't actually move to this adaptive immunity. 
So what happens then inside your alveoli, which are important because that's where our gas transfer happens, oxygen comes in, we've got CO2 going out. Here we have a healthy alveolus. Here we've got one that is suffering from excessive inflammation. Oxygen can't get transferred as well. We've got leakage of fluid from blood vessels into the surrounding area. So we've got that, that edema, that pneumonia going on, and lots of inflammation and cell death. If we don't fix this or settle it down, we die. So this is, this is not a good situation to be in. The highly pathogenic um, bird flu strains that we worry about now have, um, and this is with medical treatment, somewhere around 40% mortality. So these are not strains that, that you want to get infected with. Really our only option for dealing with these is if you catch it early enough, we do have some drugs that we can use to treat the flu. There are some problems. If you go much past that third day, once you start getting those really nasty symptoms, it really doesn't help. So if you're going to stop the virus from replicating, you need to do it within the first couple days of infection. And the ones that work now are things that we call neuraminidase inhibitors. So if you remember the virus, two proteins on the surface, one's hemagglutinin, which it uses to attach to a cell. The other is neuraminidase, which it uses to release from a cell after, um, after the infection cycle. The neuraminidase we can block with these drugs. You might have heard tam of Tamiflu or maybe Relenza. Um, there's a relatively new one called Rapavab. Those block their competitive inhibitors and they block the neuraminidase. So the virus gets made, but then it can't leave the infected cell. If it can't get to a new cell, then you can slow the infection down. Once that inflammatory process to get, really gets going though, um, stopping the virus at that point doesn't help much. So at this point, what we know about the 1918 flu strain and those nasty bird flu strains, which uh, most of the uh, experiments where we learned a lot of this stuff about the cells that they're infecting and this um, feedback and the inflammatory response. Most of those experiments were done in like 2005, 2006, where we were seeing an increase in the number of um, human infections with bird flu. But also there was a group at the University of Washington that pulled some of those old influenza um, 1918 strains out of the permafrost up in Siberia. They were able to piece those together and actually show experimentally that, yeah, this is what happened with the 1918 flu strain. It did have this feedback response. You do see all this inflammation that matches pretty much exactly what we saw in autopsies from 1918. What we don't know is even though we know that those viruses can do that, we know the sequences of those viruses, what we don't know is exactly why those specific viruses trigger that. Um, we can clearly show that it happens. We're not sure why those do it, and our seasonals really don't. So where we are now is we do have this issue, jump down to this last point, we do have this issue of what if one of those bird flu strains mutates just a little bit to easily be passed between humans and not just with a little bit of difficulty from birds to humans? This shows detection of those highly pathogenic avian strains over the past year. So all of these marks show either where it was detected and contained, or in red, where we're still having some problems with containment of these viruses. Fortunately, not too many people have been infected, but the potential for those things to mutate 
and actually um, cause humans a problem, um, that potential is definitely there. We don't always nail predicting what strains are going to be a problem in the next year. We know what would happen the previous year. That isn't always what happens the following year. The H3N2 strain, so one of the reasons why flu season is bad this year is because the H3N2 strain that is in the current vaccine isn't a real good match for what's circulating around right now. And there are a couple reasons for it. Either we didn't predict it well enough, which is part of it, or perhaps what we put in the vaccine just wasn't great. Um, what we found in the last few years, cultivation influence strain changes, mentioned that we used eggs to cultivate viruses to put in these vaccines. The viruses are pretty good at adapting to the host that they're in. And in this case, it was the eggs. So some subtle changes happened in those viruses while they were being grown in the eggs, and then those were put in the vaccine. Those changes didn't become obvious until we noticed that the vaccines weren't working all that well. So these types of problems um, are currently being addressed, but it was just in the last few years where that actually became a big problem for us. So quality control in vaccines um, is, is something that needs to be paid attention to. And certainly with these viruses, since they change so rapidly, um, it's something that, it, that is a little bit difficult to stay on top of. One thing that we're trying to do is develop a vaccine that will work on all flu viruses without the H or the N actually mattering. So the surface portions of those proteins are the things that change a lot from virus to virus. Within that lipid envelope where those things are embedded, those portions tend to not change all that much from, from year to year. So they're a bit more constant. So where a lot of the vaccine uh, focus is now is trying to find antibodies that will actually bind to that region and making vaccines from those regions so that we can have immunity to influenza virus regardless of what's going on with those, the most external portions of those proteins. So that's about where we are. I don't want to talk too much more because we are pretty much at the end here. So I think with that, I'll say happy Darwin Day and take any questions. <laughs>